Bring out the talent. Bring out the talent. Bring out the talent. Welcome to Bring Out the Talent, a podcast featuring learning and development experts discussing innovative approaches and industry insights. Tune in to hear our talent help develop yours. Now here are your hosts, TTA's CEO and President Maria Melfa and Talent Manager Jocelyn Allen. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us again today. This is Maria. Hi, hey everybody. It's Jocelyn. Yes, we are back. You guys keep allowing us. So here we are once again to talk to you about developing the town in your organizations. How's everything, Maria? Excellent. Thank you. I know that you and I both got puppies this weekend, so we're both a little <laughs> sleep deprived. Yes. But it seems like puppy season at TTA Mm -hmm. So we have about, what, four new puppies in the past we week. So. And the funniest thing is, is that they're all like some version of a lab, which none of yes. it was planned, the adoption yes. process or the breeds. Yet here yes. we are um, all jumping on a bandwagon together. So. <laughs> good. <laughs> good sound bite, David. Oh, yes. oh, wow. Look at it. Oh, yes. Oh, you have God. a black one, too. Chocolate. Yes. Chocolate. Okay. Chocolate. Chocolate. See, it's just no, the that's way to fantastic. be. A boy, girl. Julia. A girl about two and a half. Two and a half. Excellent. Oh my God, what a precious little page. Fantastic. Well, let's get right into it, Julia. And I guess that was a pretty good segue. So, Maria, you want to tell everybody <laughs> about our guest today? Absolutely. So, a little intro. Anyone who thought that the rise of remote and hybrid work would negatively impact teamwork have likely changed their tune by now. Research has revealed that teamwork is more important now than ever. So much so that approximately 75% of employees rate teamwork and collaboration as being extremely important. And companies that promote collaboration and teamwork have been linked to reducing employee turnover rates by 50%. In today's episode, we discuss creating radical teams with the author of Radical Outcomes, Juliana Stan Campiano. Hi, Juliana. We're so excited to have you today. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. And you did a great job. Thank you very much. So we are thrilled to have you join us today because leadership and creating teams is something that I am very passionate about and believe all leaders are passionate about, or at least should be passionate about it. Right. So <laughs> you, you recently wrote a book called Radical Outcomes. As we just mentioned, it's a fresh perspective on teamwork, and we're excited to dive into it more and learn more from you. Speaking of your book, what led you to write it? Yeah, you know, that's a funny question because I've been asked for many years by people if I'm going to write a book. Are you going to write a book? Are you going to write a book? And it was something that felt very intimidating to me, probably like a lot of people out there, the majority of people, to put pen to paper when it uh, was something you know, that my sophomore English teacher didn't think I was amazing at, which kind of lasts with you, right? You have those <laughs> less than stellar events. And so I was actually reached out to by Wiley and asked if I would put together, you know, a synopsis of a book. And I thought, I and I called a few people that I knew that had written books and said, what do you think I should do? And they said, for all the people that want a publisher and can't get one, you're not being very kind <laughs> like to your fellow colleagues. You should do the synopsis and write a book. And I said, okay, I will do that and see what happens. You know, wrote the synopsis and they accepted it and got a book contract. So it was, that was essentially kind of the why behind writing it. That's a remarkable accomplishment. How long did it take you to write the book? About nine months. And I will say, you know, part of writing it is that it was also a team effort. I did all of the outlining with my team, a couple of team members specifically that have very strong writing skills, you know, did a lot of the revs and revisions with those team members as well. Struggled on some parts where I had a team member that interviewed me and then she would try to write up, you know, what I said. And, you know, I think it's hard to be a writer and talk about things that people think you're really good at, but it it becomes an unconscious competence for you at some point in your career. And um, I know we're going to, there are lots of questions you're going to ask me today, and I'm going to try my best to articulate my thoughts. But sometimes it's hard to put it down on paper. And so it was really a, quite the team effort and drive to the end. And I had another team member who was really wonderful and did all the, like the 
you know, the footnotes and everything, which might have put me in my grave early if I had to do all of those. And we had a wonderful editor at Wiley as well, who, you know, gave great feedback and helped us along in the process and having never done it before. I'm an avid reader. And when I like read books, sometimes I'm like the amount of extra detail that you have to put in to fill pages sometimes is probably what was the most intimidating thing is like how my, I don't journal because my hand doesn't move fast enough for my thoughts. And by the time I'm done thinking about it and think it's going to go in a journal, I'm like, what was I thinking about? No, <laughs> yeah. It is a heck of an accomplishment. Yes. <laughs> and then every time you look at content, you want to redo it. That's our problem. Right. So we have, you know, marketing strategy meetings every Monday and we will approve something. And then I'll look at it again. I'm like, we approve this? This doesn't look right. We need to do it again. <laughs> and it's really interesting. So I could imagine, that, you know, that that was what an incredible accomplishment and so good to have that done. And hopefully you had a big celebration. And yes, we did. Thank you. Yeah. Big celebration uh, had by everyone. And, and it was a lot of fun. You know, it's one of those things that you look back and we learned a lot with one another in the process, right? Of having to do something that you feel like is really hard and challenging. That That's what we're all kind of here doing within our careers and lives. And when you take on those hard challenges, sometimes they're the most rewarding. And that one was definitely very, re you know, very rewarding for everyone involved. Who doesn't love an opportunity to throw a good party and celebrate? So <laughs> and you've got quite an impressive background that obviously led you to be and and the people around you to be inspired about the content that you could provide in order to write a book. So you've worked across Europe, the Middle East, Africa. What about those experiences changed your view on teamwork and how did it, you know, apply to the book? Yeah, you know, I felt so lucky to have that experience early in my career. Because, you know, and I remember being in Europe at one point and thinking everybody should have to go somewhere that they didn't grow up and learn how to live there <laughs> because it's not easy, right? And, and it's the everyday things. Like I just, I remember being in Germany and being like, I need to write a check to like pay my rent. And they were like, we don't write checks here this early 2000s. And I was like, how do I pay my rent? And it was all online and the U.S. was not doing online banking at that time. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, okay. Like somebody has to tell me how to do this fast because, you know, I'm going to be late on my rent. And so it's very humbling, right? When you go from something you're very used to, to the day-to-day -day being very different. And that goes for working with colleagues, right? So I show up and it, we're celebrating different holidays and I'm in Ireland and I'm speaking to a colleague and she's going, da -da 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 and I'm like, I have no idea what you're saying. I know you're speaking English to me, but can you instant message me, please? <laughs> you know, and, and so you learn just so many little things about working across different cultures and different ways of working and different belief systems that you really tune into individuals, I think, a lot more than thinking about one homogenous whole, which as we all know, doesn't really exist. You know, there's the engineers are not all like this and the French people are not all like that, you know? And so I think that was what I really honed in and was able to learn so much about working with people across so many different countries. And it was so fun. You know, I, I got to learn so many things that would have never been presented to me if I hadn't taken that leap. It's interesting because I think about that often because we're just exposed to so many different things in the world we live now. I mean, social media, you get, you know, 20 seconds at your fingertips will expose you to everything that's going on in the world. So I always wonder, like, what's going on in other places that people are existing, right? Like you being from the U.S. and being over in Germany and you're like, why don't they do this in everywhere? Or, you know you guys are doing this and you should really be doing it this way because, you know, things like that. There's so many things out there that we just aren't aware of. So I love that you took the opportunity to take those pieces of information and what these individuals, like these characteristics that they had that made them stand out to you and create something that defines how to build an effective team. Like it's, it's genius. <laughs> Thank you. I think, you know, it's one of those things where it's just a life experience and you go through it and you learn from it, but you don't know how you're going to, how it's going to come to life. 
later on. But I think when I first came back from the U.S., I thought, well, if nothing else, I have a lot of empathy for U.S. companies working with many people in different offices around the world and those people's points of view because they are smart, they are talented, and we need to listen a little bit more. So I think, you know, bringing that like listening lens once I was back in the U.S. and trying to bring those ideas over and man, we can really, as Americans, <laughs> drive our feet in the ground on some of these things. But, but to your point, there are so many wonderful ideas out there if we're just open to seeing them and accepting that that could be a good way for us as well. Was there anything in particular that you learned um, when you lived there as far as how organizations work on developing teams? Yeah, you know, Yes, I think Europe especially, they put a lot of time and effort into the development of their people and the development of teams. And I did a lot of teamwork development while I was there, which was awesome. I got to put together these amazing offsites for people to go learn new things and myself included because I was so young at the time. I didn't know how to build rapport or you know, I didn't even know that existed as a concept at the right, time, right. you know, and so I was able to work within a few different teams that worked across some directors and help them build team camaraderie and team development and learning. And so I learned so much from that time because I didn't know all these things either. So, it was, you know, it's probably on a growth curve. It was probably that steep track at the beginning of your career. But I, you know, I, I think I learned a lot of it was it, you have to get people together and give them the time away from work as well to get to know one another and to learn things together and figure things out and have that white space. It makes such a huge difference once you're back in the office or whatnot to collaborate on things that are going to be hard because you have something else to, you know, to base that relationship off of. It's not just the work, you know, and it's like, hey, I know we learned in this offsite that you know, I'm an ENTJ or whatever, you know, so it, we did the MBTI and things, you know, so you got to learn those things. Like, I, but I understand that our client is like this. So help me understand how we can work together that you can use your strengths and I can use mine and we can have a success out of this. You know, if, if you didn't have that time away to do that work, nobody would have been able to, to speak that language. Thank you for that extra insight. I think that cultural perspective is always something that people are interested about, especially if we're talking about, you know, internationally I and mean, how it affects your workforce, because everybody's working globally and remotely, remotely at this point, you know. Let's go back to your book a little bit, because something that we really liked was your speaking about outputs versus outcomes. What is the difference between these and how do you drive towards the most impactful outcomes? Yeah, it's such a great question and something that we probably all run into a lot where you show up to a meeting and somebody's like, I've created these six things. And you're like, why did you create those six things? You know, why is <laughs> that PowerPoint created? Help me, help me understand. And, and, you know, as a leader of a company, you think, oh my gosh, how much time did you spend on these things that they're not helpful, you know, or not useful. And so those are the outputs, right? Like all the things that we do on it, we create on a day-to-day -day basis. Are they actually working towards something bigger? And I think what we see a lot of times is that the outcome's not clear for someone. It's not well-defined. We don't know exactly what it is. And so people doing their best, which I think I fundamentally believe people come to work and want to do well. That's just a fundamental belief that I hold. They start creating stuff because they want to add value. And if it's not clear where you're headed and what the outcome is, you know, what we're trying to drive, then those things can a lot of times not be helpful and end up with a lot of wasted time, you know, set to the side. Doesn't make the person feel great right? That has been doing this work and trying to work on these things. And it doesn't help you drive towards the outcome, which is really more about some sort of business driver, business result, or like, you know, what does it take to build a podcast? <laughs> right? You could say, hey, we want to launch a podcast. And somebody goes off and creates all the marketing materials for it. And you're like, but we haven't decided what the angle is going to be, you know? And, and so 
having that real clear outcome and structure of what you're going to do is very helpful so that people create the outputs that are actually going to help you drive that outcome forward versus randomize a lot of people and create, you know, create a lot of swirl at the, you know, especially at the beginning of things that's going to slow you down. So back to what you said, because I'm glad that you said it because it was the first thing that I thought of and something that we often talk about here is that line between, okay, like, thank you for your ideas and we really appreciate them and we don't want you to stop giving them, right? And um, actually working towards an outcome and profit. So like, where does that balance come in? That's got to be a challenge that you've addressed and experienced, right? So I think that's probably what most people are thinking. It's like, well, how do I do that? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I think as business owners, right, you're constantly thinking about that balance with people and you want them to add value to the company on a consistent basis and to the clients and to the other other people. You know, and I think this is where being really clear is probably the best thing that you can try to do. And and man, it like context, 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 context. People need context. You can't just tell them, hey, go do, you know, go create this thing for me. You know, they'll create it in a vacuum and come back and it won't be what you asked for. Right. And so you're immediately seeing this loss of value and time. And so I think as leaders, we can slow down. We can provide as much. Let me explain to you why it is that I'm asking you to go do this thing. Let me tell you how it's going to fit into the larger uh, picture. That can be very frustrating as a leader. And I can empathize with that. And it's also your job. (laughs) And so I, I do think there's like that, you know, real slow down so that you're not wasting your profit. You're not wasting people's time and you're being as efficient as possible. And you also know that there's going to be, you know, it's the 80-20 rule, right? You'll get 80% there and there'll always be 20% that happens and everybody goes, oh, you know, the head slap. I should have asked, I should have told you these things or I should have asked you some further questions or, you know, what happened recently, even within my team was I went into a client meeting, was trying to help drive something, later had a conversation with somebody on my design team and she said, I created a document for that. And I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> You know, so that communication and and driving that across the team is so important. But, you know, people and profit are always something to balance. And I think as long as you think about what the outcome is and talk about outcomes with your stakeholders and what you're driving towards, it helps to quiet the questions about the people. Because sometimes I think we jump to people and it's not, that's actually not the issue. <laughs> you know, it is the are we all clear on what it is that we're driving? And this is how I'm going to get people there. Now I need to do my job and my people need to do their jobs so we can get there. Sometimes it's just the organizational structure. I know you mentioned in your book about we must question best practices. It's, it's not okay because we've done it this way for many years. And I know that's something that we certainly try to do here. And sometimes it's kind of a fine line because sometimes you are creating new things when we did have a solid best practice. Sure. So, but it kind of, it goes to what you're saying, clearly communicating the why, what we need to do. So it really comes down to clear communication. I was just going to say that, Maria, like I, there is a common thread in a lot of our conversations and it is communication and it's in adapting how it needs to be delivered depending on what your result needs to be. So I mean, you took the words right out of my mouth, Maria. Yes, and I know we're all going so fast right now, as you said, Juliana. And, you know, it just sometimes it it's not something that we enjoy doing. Yes, we have to slow down. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the old adage about going slow to move fast. You yes. know, there's so much to that of, hang on, let's all get on the same page. Seems to, and, you know, I think one of the tricky things is for leaders is, And this is something that I learned when I was in Europe as well is if you feel it, say it. So I think a lot of times we get into meetings and we're driving really hard and we're trying to do all of these things and we know the team's kind of off, but we don't say it because we just need them to do this thing. You know, we just need them to get this thing done. And I've learned that if you feel it, you say it, hey, if I've, I'm feeling like this meeting's off, this doesn't, you know, people feel like 
I don't know what's going on, to be honest. I just feel like something's not aligned. Can somebody help me understand what's going on? And when you give people that permission, you normally hear like, this thing happened or we made a mistake on this other thing. And then you're like, okay. And then you're in it and you're like actually driving towards getting what it is that you need versus if you don't say anything, you're more than likely not going to end up with what you were trying to drive for and be very frustrated about it. And it is very hard to say the thing because it typically feels personal you know, or feels like it might, hey, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Like, I just feel like we're off or we're moving slow and I don't understand why. Like, can somebody help me understand? And, and then, and you'll get that information. But I, I think that's a real key aspect to helping your team. And also, you know, it goes to that creating that psychological safety happens in those small moments. It took me a while to feel comfortable to say the thing that I was feeling. But it's amazing what it unlocks and it can, you can do it with clients, you can do it with your team. And it typically unlocks the conversation that you need to be having versus the one that you are having. Very interesting. Psychological safety, once again, because I'm thinking in the back of my mind, I try to think as a leader, as an employee, right? Like how would I tackle this situation if I was the person in front of the room who had the audience that wasn't hitting the mark? Or how would I feel if I was the employee like sitting in the room being like, we're not hitting the mark and I want to tell you why and I don't know how to tell you why. It is important because like most of the time what I found too, I'm going on a little tangent here, but in situations you mentioned like with clients, when you're transparent, it is 99.9% of the time appreciated over like diminishing the value of either the work you've done up until that point or the fact that you had a validating question to ask. And so psychological safety, I definitely think is something that every organization really needs to focus on and understanding if that is actually something that's occurring in your workplace, because otherwise you're just unaware of like what's actually going on too, because nobody's telling you. So like, where did where do you start with that? Like that, like even just me spewing that out, that sounds like a lot. So where do you begin? How do you get to an extraordinary team when you're facing those challenges? You start incrementally. And I think, you know, that's the, that's what I feel like doesn't get talked about a lot to be very honest is, and I love Amy Edmonds and her research. I love Brene Brown and all of her research. I feel like they're more of our leaders of today than, than a lot of others. And it, it it's broken down, right? So it's in the mo- the small moments. It's not in the big moments. It's in the moment when you go, hey, you sound like you're out of breath or like kind of stressed out in front of a team. Can we help you? You know, and the person goes, oh, yes, I just, you know, I just had my kid fall and, you know, knock his head or whatever, and he's bleeding because <laughs> we're all working from home and these things are happening. You know, it's like, okay. Go like, go take care of that. We'll come back to this later. Take a beat. You know, that's an instance of just like creating that safety where somebody feels comfortable enough to do, to tell you what's going, really going on versus trying to say, no, 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 everything's fine. You know, and I think as a leader, you have to exemplify that yourself. And, you know, I had an employee one time that wrote an email to a client that was apologizing. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. First, she had nothing to apologize for. This is just something that I think is really poorly ingrained, especially with women, is to apologize. And that was my biggest beef with it. It was like, you have nothing to apologize for. They just needed an explanation. And I got into the office and I said, do you want to walk through the email? And she said, yes. And I said, do you want to do it in here? Do you want to go into a conference room? Because we're in front of everyone else. She said, no, we can do it here. And I said, okay. And I, there wasn't, I wasn't mean about it. I wasn't, you know, yelling. I just said, here's how I would have restructured it. This is what I would have said. You don't need to say this. Didn't need to say that or these other things. And she was like, I'm so grateful for the feedback and the whole team heard, right? And she was feeling, feeling that pressure. But in that moment, she felt safe enough to let me do it. I was not mean. We had an amazing learning moment. And then we, and I moved on like really quickly, you know, I was like, as the leader. And I think those are those moments that you have to have to build psychological safety. And you have to have like probably 600 of them. 
<laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. At least, at least, at least. <laughs> Because you can create that environment, but as we know, people bring all of their thoughts and feelings to the workplace. So they might have grown up in an atmosphere where they did not feel safe at all. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just bringing that forth in so many different levels. Mm -hmm. So no one said leadership was easy, right? No, and I think that's the like getting to know the individuals mm -hmm. is so important. Like I need to understand everyone on my team so that, or like everybody that I'm interacting with on a really regular basis, at least you know, as it grows. And I want my, my managers to be doing the same because you have to know that when somebody reacts maybe strongly about something where that could be coming from so that you can give them some of that grace and then be able to support them on that. Hey, I think you took this, you know, this way. That's what, how I read it. And I think it was intended this way. So, I just, you know, you, you want to continue to even those playing fields. And you can't do that if you don't know the person. Yes. Right. Very no, it's interesting. I remember experience many years ago. We had a employee who was really good. She did a great job. But whenever she did make a mistake, she would always try to cover it up. And we would always talk to her and say, you know, so and so, it is. It's perfectly fine. We just need to, you know, learn from our mistakes. It's perfectly fine. We've all made tons of mistakes. I would talk about the many mistakes that we had, and it's just something that really bothered her for years. And I later found out that she had a major tragedy when she was young, and she was kind of in, involved in this a death in her family, and it it was a complete accident. And I just, you know, it, it, it was such a obviously very sad situation, but, you know, you, you don't realize no, no matter what. So you try to get very, very close, but mm -hmm. it, it really is so important to really understand where each individual is coming from and, mm -hmm. and treating everybody, you know, different based on where they're coming from. Right. And that it's going to take different amounts of time yes. depending on when they're, where they're coming from yes. too. Absolutely. And that was like a big milestone with that person because she really struggled to ask for help. So similarly, like had an upbringing where you didn't ask for help. You just did the thing, you know, don't ask, like just do it. And so asking for help felt very uncomfortable. Right. And so it was like, well, I'm going to offer more help to you so that you don't have to ask for it. You can just take it when it's offered, you know, and you can kind of shift and adjust for the different people. And it just takes time and diligence in doing it. So you do talk a lot about information overload. And I know that's a major problem that we all have. It's it's just unbelievably crazy. It's really now there's, there's so many outlets. Like there's so many anywhere. Out yes. Yeah. How much any information would you like? <laughs> <laughs> and that's really hard because I find myself sometimes forwarding really good articles to my team, a lot of times to the marketing because, oh, look at this. This is great. This look at this. This is awesome. Look at this. So fantastic. And then after sending, you know, 20 emails in a couple of days, I'm like, you know what? I have to kind of stop. And and like you're saying now, I'm I'm thinking. I probably need to take a step back and explain why I'm sending that to them and why. And I do sometimes, but probably not enough. Yeah. You know, I think just as we all left, like everybody's facing information overload. And so how do we help our people not feel inundated uh, in needing to needing and wanting to learn new things? But where do you start? You know, like there's so many things that you can learn and there's so many things that you can read about. I'm a big proponent of highly curated information. And to your point, like be very intentional about why you're sharing it. We also like we have a knowledge sharing, you know, Slack channel that we use. And that to me just it can fill up. But I don't have to really bother myself by reading all of it because nobody's told me why. It is that they think I should. They just found it really interesting, right? So it's good to share the things that we find interesting. If people have time or they're interested, they can also read and I can kind of see what everybody's in tune with. And that's interesting for me to see as a leader. But, you know, really explaining why it is that you're giving somebody something and giving them that context about it. And I think being thoughtful about what it is that we're creating as well as learning people, you know, there's just so much. 
So how do we make something that is actually really relevant for the person that's going to consume it? And that's where my interest really lies is like honing in as corporations and companies on what the person actually needs, not all the things we think they need, you know, to be able to do the thing and then, you know, how to go find the things when they need it. Because I think that's probably most of what we all do. Like you need to know something like my Nespresso machine. Every time I just scale it, I go to YouTube and I look up the video because I can never remember exactly how to do it. And there is somebody that has posted a great home video and I can figure out how to do it. So how do we incorporate that for our companies as a model versus just really pushing lots of stuff at them? Another good segue into uh, a part of your book that we also really loved because it focuses on like TTA's collaboration as well, is that extraordinary teams have role clarity and they understand that at some point they will need to cover for each other. Agreed. We love that. Let people have some time off. Let's work together to get to an end result faster, better, more efficiently. What's the best way to go about this and actually achieve that in an organization? You know, I think I have totally adopted Brene's Brown, like clear is kind. It's kind of my one mantra, honestly, from her that I just find invaluable as a leader. It doesn't mean that it's always going to feel good. <laughs> But it does mean that, you know, it, it's being clear for somebody else, right? So that role clarity, I think, is so important to understand. You know, I don't know how many times we've run into, you know, another organization and you have somebody in a role that isn't a learning designer. Say they're a PM and they're like, well, I was thinking you could do X and Y with your design. And you're like, thank you for the feedback. <laughs> you know, to and, and who knows if it's a good idea or not, but it just kind of comes out of left field and you're, and it throws, throws you off. Right. And so, and that person potentially is, has no idea what they're talking about. Nobody knows what maybe their background is. Right. So how do you get really clear on the roles? But then when somebody has to be out, you step in, you know what their role was because it was clear to you from the beginning, you understand what it is that they're having to do. You know, you bring somebody that's got some of those capabilities and you let them cover. It works really well. And I think role clarity is a lot of times I feel like what people are asking for constantly at work. Just tell me exactly what you expect of me. Tell me what it is that you want me to drive, right? We hear this consistently to managers. And I think this relates again to the outcomes. It's like, what's my part in that thing that we're doing? And if you can help me understand that, I'll do that to the best of my ability is typically where people are. And so big on the role clarity, you know, transparency goes a long ways with the team where it's, there shouldn't, I mean, none of the role clarity things should be hidden from anybody. That shouldn't be a thing at all. In my mind, everybody should know what everybody's working on and what they're doing. I think, you know, transparency comes into play when for me, we have deadlines that we have to hit. And a big part of my leadership is that I, I don't care what, how people kind of spend their time as long as these deadlines get hit. Uh, because I have some people that like to work until 2 a.m. And I have some people that are out at five, you know, and everybody has their own thing going on. But if you don't know that as a, you know, as a leader or as the PM driving the work, if you don't know those things are happening, oh my gosh, you can have so much angst about so-and-so is not awake and it's like 9 a.m. <laughs> or whatever. You know, it's like, well, did you notice that she turned in her documents at, you know, 1.45 in the morning? So that probably had something to do with it. But if you don't know how people work or what they have, you know, there are big rocks of like, I, I drop my kids off every day at school or I take my dog for a walk at this time every afternoon because otherwise he's barking at me. You know, those types of things is what I think of when I think of transparency, which we haven't historically allowed in our workplace. And I think this is the pandemic has done an amazing job of breaking down a lot of those barriers and you get to know your people even more. And so it's so much easier as a leader to come into a meeting and say, yes, I know that so-and-so was out because they do this thing and I'm aware of it. And this is how we need to organize the work to make sure that it works for everyone. And I think, you know, having that view I had a boss early on that actually was so nice about this where she said, well, it was kind of funny because she said, if you need to do anything during the day, you tell me so that I can cover for you. But if I don't know where you are, I can't cover for you. 
And I would like run out and get my eyebrows waxed, you know, like lunchtime and come back or like go see a dentist appointment because dentists are not open on Saturday and Sunday, which employers seem to forget sometimes, you know, and, and it wasn't that I wasn't doing my work. I just needed to do those things. And she taught me, you know, she gave me the psychological safety that she had my back, that she wouldn't tell anybody else. She would basically just say I was out doing something. But if she didn't know, she was really upset. And I think that's a lot where that comes from. It's like, if I don't know, I can't help you. So tell me so I can help all of us. <laughs> I'm not gonna, you're not going to get in trouble for doing these things because guess what? I have to do these things too. So as we're wrapping up, what are some tips that you can share with our listeners who want to embark on creating teamwork in an environment where teams can flourish? You know, I think the top things are probably something that I've said over and over again, but if you're creating a team for the first time, get to know your people really well, both professionally and some personally, like to the extent that that, that works and be very clear. I think if anything, like driving clarity, which is context and the why and taking the time to do that makes everything else run faster. And that, I think that's what we miss. And what leaders miss sometimes, like, oh, it feels so laborious. And I feel like I've said this, you know, or whatever, or I just don't have the time to do this. Then find the time that you can take to do it because downstream, you will not encounter all the issues that you couldn't, you know, that you would if you didn't take the time to do that. So those few things to get started, you know, start to build that. It, it starts building the psychological safety that we're talking about. And you'll eventually get there and it'll just continue to grow and grow. And then when the big things happen, you know, you, you have to show up for that. I love it. I love that you even gave tips in the way that you said to go about it, that like the way to implement these things is to start slow. So you're like, here's two things. Like, let's start there. I love that. I think it's perfect. It just amplifies like the the validity to how you kind of go about the the making a team and, and creating something that's really dynamic and engaging. So I noticed. I saw you. <laughs> I think it's funny because I, I sometimes get feedback from people of like, did you see that so-and-so is this or so-and-so is doing that? And it's like, calm down. It's going to work itself out. Just give me like two more months and we're going to get there. It, or like, we need to do this and we need to implement this. And it's like, it's in the works. It's not going to happen overnight, but in like six months, that'll be in place. And so I think we just, we have a thing with speed and things actually don't get done overnight. They just don't. Mm -hmm. And so when you can be like, I read this thing that Bill Gates published and it was like, he has a, a horizon of like 10 years to get things done. And I was like, wow, a 10-year horizon, that's a good thing, you know. I'm thinking probably more quarters or six months in my my head primarily. And so I can see the horizon of where we're going. But uh, there's something to be said for just that time and space to let something happen. Yep, that time, upfront investment leads to less investment down down the line. I absolutely totally. see that. Yeah. All right, Juliana. Well, we are at that point in our episode where we introduce you to the liveliness of TTA and to our segment, the TTA 10. It's the TTA 10, 10 final questions for our guest. All right, Juliana. So as I said, before we started the episode, what the TTA 10 was all about, we are going to time 10 questions that I'm going to ask you. And the goal is to get your answers out within 90 seconds. If you do, we will celebrate. We will give you kudos, a resume builder even, and some wonderful sound effects from our producer, David. It doesn't get better than that. And then if we don't achieve it, well... There may be some playful, not so awesome sound effects that played. So we, no pressure. It's all in good fun and good spirits, but let's get this party started. If you are ready, Juliana, Juliana, I'm sorry. I keep doing that. Oh, good. If you're ready, Juliana, I'm ready. All right, David, give me the thumbs up when the timer is started. 90 seconds on the clock beginning in three, two, one, you're off. Coffee or tea? Coffee. What is your favorite color? Red. Who's your favorite musical artist? 
Oh, Brandy Carlisle currently. Garden gnomes, cute or creepy? Oh, creepy. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would you choose? Probably France and Seattle, where I'm at. Awesome. What is the tenth letter of the alphabet? Oh my gosh, no idea. J, my first. Yeah, nice. That's how I know it. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> what was your favorite subject in school? Entrepreneurship. I took it in college. Which of the seven dwarfs do you most relate to? None of them off the top of my head that I can remember. <laughs> uh, if you could learn a brand new skill today, what would it be? Oh, I would love to be like a professional chef. I've been trying to cook and so much skill goes into that part. In The Little Mermaid, what is the name of Ariel's pet fish? No idea, but I can see it. You can see him. <laughs> I need my daughter. <laughs> Who is on the $1 bill? Is that Washington or is he on the... Yeah, there you go. Does pineapple belong on pizza? No. No. All right, David, we are done. Let's get an official time reading. It was close. I remind you <laughs> that 90 seconds was the threshold. <laughs> Juliana completed the TTA 10 in 88 seconds with two seconds Woo! to spare. <laughs> I didn't answer two. Oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but when you answered wrongly, you answered quickly. And therefore, <laughs> we are pleased to tell you that, Juliana, you are a TTA 10 champion. You may shout this nice. news from the rooftops, dazzle your friends at cocktail parties, and include it on your resume. <laughs> now that you have achieved this coveted honor, you will be respected and loved by captains of industry, <laughs> heads of state, social media influencers, and Uber drivers. The sun will shine brighter for you. Food will taste better. And life will have new meaning. Congratulations, Juliana. You are a TTA 10 champion. I mean, is there any better feeling than that, Juliana? I mean, no, I come mean, on. I feel right? like I can just take on the world at this point. Come on. Well, thank you so much. This was wonderful. I loved listening to your story, your feedback on how to create radical teams. Awesome. Thank you both so much for having me. I appreciate it. That was fun. If you're interested in more information on Juliana's book and creating radical teams in your organization, visit us at thetrainingassociates.com. We'll see you later.